For the past four weeks, we've been in this series called Soul Searching, and we've been looking at life's big questions. Where did we come from? We looked at what is our purpose? Why are we here? We've looked at what is good, and we looked at what happens when we die. Where do we go when we die? All these questions are, are important to answer because all of our hearts are longing for those questions, and there are many answers to life's big questions. And so it was important for us to go back and see what is the biblical worldview, what is the biblical perspective in each of these. And what we have found is that the answers are, are far and away better than what we could have imagined. Number one, where did we come from? We saw that we came from God, that God created human beings as the crown of his creation. He created them to rule over his creation, created them not by speaking them into existence like everything else, but hands-on molded them, shaped them, built them like a, a contractor builds a house. We saw that God made us with a purpose, that he placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to work, to have relationships with others, and have a relationship with him. We saw that God is good. In a world that's craving goodness, we saw that God is the ultimate source of goodness. And we saw that because Adam and Eve sinned. They betrayed God, they turned their back on him, and yet God maintained his goodness to them. Promised them a savior from their sin. He didn't destroy them, he didn't get rid of them, he promised to save them. What a comfort for you and me as we sin, as we turn our backs on God, as, as we don't live for God and we fail, God remains good to you and me through the cross of Jesus. Our sins are forgiven because of Him. That's God's goodness. And He remains good even when we fail to be good. And then we saw last week that where do we go when we die? back to the Garden of Eden, back to where it all started, in the perfection of the Garden, where we will see God face to face, where we will live forever, where, where the river of life flows through, where the tree of life is, and we will eat and be with God forever, where everything sad becomes undone. As I said, the answers we got to these questions are far better than we could have even imagined. And so now we close our uh, series this week with now what? How do we respond to God's goodness? For our answer, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 4 and the familiar story of Cain and Abel. And so if you want to follow along, it's on page 8. You can pull out your phone, open up the Bible app, uh, however you'd like to follow along. We're looking at 1 through 9. Here we go, verse 1. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. When did this happen? It's a good question. Adam and Eve had to leave the garden. The dust has finally settled. They're getting used to this new life. And we're told that, in, uh, that Adam and Eve had two sons. Were they the first sons? We don't know. Uh, how long after the garden did this happen? We don't know. We know they had other kids, but we don't know anything about the timeline. All we're told is that they had Cain, and then they had Abel. And we see several differences between Cain and Abel in this section. Number one, we see a difference in their occupation. We're told Cain was a farmer. He worked the soil just like his dad, Adam. Adam was a farmer. Just like Adam, Cain worked the soil, he planted the seeds, 
He watered the the ground. He worked the hard dirt. He got rid of the weeds. Uh, He made sure his crops grew. He was a farmer. Abel was a shepherd. He tended the flock. He protected the flock. He made sure the flock had food and water. They're different in their occupation. And in the course of time, we're told that they brought an offering to the Lord, which is really interesting. When did offerings begin? Sometime after the Garden of Eden. Cain and, or Adam and Eve were not offering offerings to God in the garden. Their offering to God was walking past that tree in the middle of the garden, the knowledge of good and evil. That's how they worshiped God. Sometime after the garden, they started bringing offerings to God. And Cain, we're told, brings some of his crops. What did that mean? That, mean that, that meant that Cain harvested his, uh, his uh, crops, he looked at what he needed, he looked at how much he wanted, and then what was, uh, ever was left over, he gave some of it to the Lord. He gave some of it. Abel, on the other hand, brought an offering. And that offering was the fat portions of the firstborn. The best part of that firstborn lamb he brought to the Lord. Did he know that he was going to have more lambs after that? No. Did he know if the rest of the lambs would be as good as that first lamb? No. But it didn't matter. He was going to bring the best part of that firstborn, the fat, to the Lord. There's a difference in occupation. There's a difference in their offering. Cain brought some. Abel brought the fat parts, the best part to God. And then there's a difference on how God viewed their offerings. We're told that God uh, looked with favor on Abel and on Abel's offering, but on Cain and Cain's offering, he did not. Why? Is God really concerned with the quantity of the gift? No. Here's what Hebrews 11 tells us. Hebrews was written in in the New Testament around 50, 60, 70 A.D. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. What is the main difference between Cain and Abel? Abel has faith in God. Cain did not. Abel viewed God as the good God that he is, the God who created him, the God that knit him together in his mother's womb. Abel viewed God as the God who put him here with a purpose, the God who, even though humanity has sinned and turned their back on God, he still sees God as the God who's promised to send a Savior to his parents. He views God as the God who's going to redeem him, a God of mercy, a God of grace. And it's that grace, that mercy, that view of God that causes Abel to bring the fats as an offering to God. Cain didn't have faith in God. Cain, on the other hand, probably viewed God as a hard God, a God who's a demanding God who just wants our stuff a God who has all power in the world, and for some reason, He's not taking suffering and pain away from me. A God who doesn't need my things. And because Cain had that view of God, it led to only giving some of his crops. God is the God that Abel saw. God is a good God, the one who's redeemed us, the one who has opened heaven to us, who has loved us unconditionally. And it's because of that that we want to respond to God in a way that worships Him. And we do that by your first point. We live for God by offering our fats. By offering our fats. 
This is what Abel did. The fat portions of his commodity. His commodity was his flock. He offered the fats, the first and foremost of his of his offer or of his crop or of his flocks, he offered to God. And it's because of the way he viewed God. God was good. And so how do you view God? Is God your good God? The God of the world who's redeemed you, who has everything under control, the God who is good to you no matter what the situation is, the God who's redeemed you and opened heaven to you? If that's the way you view God, are we living by offering our fats? Do we offer our fats? And I know most of you, and I know what some of you are thinking because you're jokesters. You're thinking, well, Stephen, I haven't really seen the gym in a while. And so, uh, and so uh, yes, I'm offering my fats. That's not the fats we're talking about. Are we offering the fat portions of our greatest commodities to God? Think of our time. God has blessed each and every one of us with 168 hours a week. How many of those hours are we offering to God? God doesn't say in the Old Testament to to tithe our time, 10% of our time, but let's just, for the sake of, of figuring this out, let's say we take 10% of our time and offer it to God. Do you know how many hours a week that is? 16. If you're in church on Sunday and that's the only time you're offering God your time, that's one hour a week. What are we doing with 167 other hours of our week? Are we offering God our fats? What about our talents? Are we offering God our fats? God has equipped each and every one of us. He's knit us together in our mother's wombs, giving us gifts, talents, and abilities. Are we offering the best of our talents and abilities to God and to his glory? Or are we looking to gain glory and a name for ourselves? And then, of course, what about our finances? Are we offering the fat portions to God? When we get our our check at the end of the month, Do we first write a check to God and then everything else is the bills? Or do we write bills, necessities, wants, and then God gets some of our leftovers? Are we offering God our fats? And if not, why not? It's a question that John had to wrestle with. John was a longtime church member. Uh, He'd grown up in the church And one Sunday, his pastor preached on tithing, giving 10% to God. And after the the service was over, John went up to the pastor and said, Pastor, great message this morning. I just don't think I could ever do it. Can't do it. And the pastor said, I understand, John. It's a little hard. But let me throw out a hypothetical for you. What if you try tithing for one month? One month, and whatever bills you can't cover, I'll cover So you try tithing, and if there's bills that you can't pay because of your tithing, I'll cover it for that month. Do you think you could try tithing then? And John said, I guess if you're going to cover my bills, then yeah, I could could try tithing for a month. And the pastor looked at him and said, now isn't that interesting, John? You're going to trust me, a mere man with so limited resources, to cover your bills, but you're not going to trust the God of this world who has all material possessions in his hands, who's redeemed you by sending his one and only son, who created you, who's opened heaven to you. You're not going to trust him to cover your bills if you tithe. John started tithing that month and has never looked back. And he's never missed a bill payment. If we aren't offering God our fats, why? You see, John's problem wasn't the fact that he wasn't offering fats. His problem really was his view of God. Is God who he says he is? Is he the God who has created you, who has everything in his hands, who can supply you with all good things, who is gracious, loving, compassionate? If he is, 
and you can trust him to take care of you. If we aren't offering our fats to God, we need a view, our, our view of God to be adjusted. It's not just plow forward, it's step back. Step back and remember who God is. Be in awe of our God, the God who loves you, who's knit you together in your mother's womb. For eight to nine months, as you're forming, God's knitting you. The God who promised to send His one and only Son for you, and He did. And when that nail went through His hands and His feet, the serpent's head was crushed. So that the devil can't stand and accuse you of any sin. Remember that God is the God who conquered the grave for you. So that you don't have to fear death because when you die, you're going to heaven. This is the God who loves you so much. He's taken care of all things spiritually and He will continue to take care of all things physically for you. It's that love that motivates us to do what Abel did and bring our fats and offer the fats to our God, trusting that He will take care of us. It's because of that love that we want to respond this way because we see God for who He really is, God of grace and love. Unfortunately for Cain, he never saw God that way. Here's what Cain did. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. You must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Notice how God approaches Cain in the exact same way that God approached Adam and Eve after they sinned, with gentle questions. Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Search your heart, Cain. Why? And then he said, if you do what is right, if you have faith, you will be accepted. But sin is crouching at your door, Cain. You must master it. But Cain dug in his heels. In his stubbornness, in his bitterness, he dug in, and it led to him luring his brother out to the field to kill him. Was Cain mad at Abel? No. He was really mad at God, and he took it out on Abel. It doesn't take very long for us to see the enmity between uh, the devil's line and the woman's line, right? Remember Genesis 3.15, God said, I'm going to put enmity, hatred between you and the woman, Satan? We see it right here in the first offspring of Adam and Eve. The next generation, we see that enmity between God and the, and the serpent. And it leads to the first, very first murder. Cain viewed God as that hard God. And when God's word came to him to correct him and rebuke him, He dug in and it led to more sin. We know that God is good. We know that He loves us and cares for us. We just got done talking about that. And so, how do we want to live? How do we respond to God? One, we offer our fats. Two, we live for God by humbly listening to Him. When God comes to us and He corrects us and rebukes us, when He convicts us of sin, we listen. When God says repent, we repent. And we do so because we trust that God is good. We do so because we know that God has our best interests at heart. We see this grace even with Cain. As Cain's sin increased, God's grace increased all the more as he pursued Cain. He didn't just leave Cain off to himself. God came after him. And that's what God has done for you and me. God has come after us. He has pursued us. And that pursuit led to the cross in forgiveness through the death of His Son. 
That's how far God was willing to pursue you and me. And now He comes to you and me with His Word to correct us, to rebuke us, to encourage us and comfort us with the message of His Word. And when we hear that Word, when God comes to us, we want to humbly listen to Him. When He says, sin is crouching at your door, we listen. 